in a world where most people watch movies and then forget about them. These brave heroes join forces to watch them again and then talk about them. Join them in their epic journey as they go back in time, a decade and beyond, to revisit and break down films from a vast array of genres. Do these movies hold up over time? Are they classics? Find out on Retro Movie Roundtable. Starring your hosts, Brian Fry, Chad Robinson, Destin Melbarnes, Nathan Lutz, and Russell Guest. Coming now to Headphones in Your Ears. Welcome all you lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable, the podcast where we watch movies, then talk about them. I'm your host, Chad Robinson, and joining me today is my good friend and co-host, Dustin Melbardis. Dustin, how are you? Good day, Chad. I'm, I'm doing great. It is a beautiful day in uh, lovely Texas fall, and uh, j- just the perfect type of weather for a uh, spooky season movie. Yes, it is certainly spooky season. It's my favorite season, so we'll... We'll get started. We'll just go straight in. It's a two-man show for now. It might suddenly be a third three-man show later on. Who knows? It's crazy October season. You never know. A shocking reveal could come through later on yeah, at so, the most unexpected of times. Or maybe not. Maybe we'll just disappoint everyone. But <laughs> Sometimes you don't see the monster. Yes. So in spooky season, Dustin, we're talking about screams. What is the best on screen movie scream you can think of so i i did think about this and i had many screams come to mind um and i actually amended the question a bit i'm going to give you a female scream and a male scream but both of the most impactful to me were actually from tv shows i don't like moving that deviating from the question too much but the uh the male scream is in the show game of thrones uh when theon and the Greyjoys attack winterfell and uh, the two uh, he, he presents the two sort of charred bodies uh, to the citizens, the, the people that live in Winterfell, and the, the old maester yells out uh, just a, 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 a moan, a wail, uh, just a, 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 a despair uh, scream that has stuck with me. And, and it blocked out all other screams um, except for one other one, uh, which would be from the end of Twin Peaks' The Return, uh, Agent Dale Cooper asks Laura Palmer, what year is it? And not realizing what is going on in that show at all, she lets out just a blood-curdling classic scream. Both of these really were so, like, in my mind that I couldn't even think of other movie screams. Oh, those are both excellent and oh, so memorable. For me, I kind of went a different direction. So Russell writes these questions for us. When I read it, what stuck with me, I saw The Ring in theaters and there's a girl that's found in the closet and the audience reaction to that imagery just this shriek went out throughout the theater and that is stuck with me this is very early right this is early when we see like what happens to the people that have seen the videotape right yeah and like they're i I know exactly what you're talking about yep yep it's uh it's all kinds of horrible there Okay, and Dustin, what is the last movie you saw? Um, I was, uh, over the weekend, I had some some downtime while I was uh, being the DD for some of my my friends on a bachelor party, and uh, I didn't want to go to one of the events they were doing, uh, so I actually sat down and watched the entirety of Blade Runner again. Uh, the first the first movie that I had been a full-time host on for this show, I was like, you know what, this movie's great, I'm going to sit down and watch it. Okay, yeah, and check out our Blade Runner podcast if you want to hear Dustin talk about that movie. It's good enough that he watched it again. In the same year, that's rare for me. I, on the other hand, Dustin, you have been giving me a very hard time about my constant horror movie watching. So in order to avoid being mocked by you, I watched The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. (laughs) I went as far or in the other direction as humanly possible. I just picked the most ridiculous sounding chick flick I could. You know wow. what? I enjoyed it though. <laughs> yeah. I, I found myself enjoying it. It's a nice coming of age story about four friends. So yeah, begrudging, but nevertheless, that's, <laughs> that's, that's where you push me. 
Does that? Uh, that, that you that yeah you, you went on a you you had a treasure map to find the most anti horror movie that you could find and you landed on the Sisterhood of Traveling Pants. I'll use that as an analogy from now on. You know <laughs> I, we know we know that the opposite of black is white. We know that the opposite of up is down. What's the opposite of a horror movie? Oh, Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. Yes, it's Blake <laughs> Lively and America Ferrera. Yes, absolutely. So speaking of opposites from Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants, Dustin, what movie are we doing today? Well, it's got a really sweet title. So, you know, it's got a sweet, loving title. Uh, We're looking at The Loved Ones from 09. Yes, it is a very, very romantic horror movie. The reason I am hosting, because this was my dealer's choice. We could have picked, I, I need to read Russell's text when I sent this to him. He says, of all the films you could have chosen in all the hist- horror catalog, <laughs> what possessed you to pick this film? And we will talk about that shortly. So The Loved Ones, it's starring Xavier Samuel, Robin McLevy, Victoria Thane, Jessica McNamee, Richard Wilson, and John Brumpton. It's an Australian flick. It's, it's actually, it's marked as 2009. It's released widely in 2010. It's got a budget of about four million dollars, so pretty bare bones. It grosses three hundred and fifty-eight thousand. It's it's not shown yeah. <laughs> pretty yeah. much anywhere. Movies that placed ahead of it in the box office, we have an NA as well as ahead of it, behind it. The number one story though, if you want a, a feel-good tearjerker, it's Toy Story Three. IMDB gives the loved ones a six point six. The critic Tomato Meter gives it a whopping 98%. Mm-hmm. This is higher than some of the best of the best horror movies. That's intriguing. Our audience score, they don't like it as much, but it's still at a very respectable 73%. The awards, we've got to go to some horror awards. The AACTA Award nomination for Best Original Screenplay. The Fangoria Chainsaw Award, very prestigious, two nominations. <laughs> And the Fright Meter, it gets seven nominations. This is also ranked as the number 49 out of the top 100 horror movies in Rotten Tomatoes. So going into this movie, Dustin, had you seen The Loved Ones? I had not. uh, And I I knew that uh, this was going to be your dealer's choice. So when this uh, was presented to me, I just I just had to find the right moment to sit down and watch it uh, for the first time and not watching any trailers. Truly, the only thing I saw about it was um, maybe the movie poster, like when I streamed the movie. Um, And that doesn't really reveal much of anything. I even stopped reading this um, sort of. What, what, whatever these services do, like as an introduction to the movie, like just describing it, like I, I stopped myself reading it. I wanted to be completely surprised by it. Oh, um, boy. <laughs> and were you? And, oh, totally. And and in, and in a really pleasant way. Um, I think there was something that I, I saw how well it had been talked about, but the 98 percent of the critic tomato meter surprises me because of the reviews that I read after the fact – most of these people, you know, did not rate it like an A plus in term out of their scales. Uh, they, they, it was it was getting closer to what our audience score was. Um, but nobody, ha- I couldn't find anything negative to say about the the, the movie from any of these critic uh, critiques that I had read. So like I I thought like you know what it, like I can you know, probably name like the ten great things of this movie before I start gravitating to any of the 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 critical stuff the the negative stuff like this was this was a pretty cool thrill ride all right this warms my dealer's choice heart for me my experience i was actually going through and trying to knock out the rotten tomatoes top 100 movies this was a couple years back and this was one that i was missing and it's right in the middle of the list it's like all right i too like dustin said no context just throw it on and i was blown away I could not believe what I had just seen, and I needed some time to process it, to be honest. Coming into it a second time, I was expecting, this is a tough watch. Uh, I'll, we'll get into spoilers later, but it, it's a tough movie. It's got some tough things, and it does a lot of those things 
better than other types that might get thrown in there. I, I feel like Hostel may get put in this same genre. I don't think it's deserved. This is a lot deeper than a movie like Hostel, but it, it could be placed into the Saw and the Hostel type situation. So, so yeah, I, yeah. I was interested in foisting this on the podcast and saying, now you guys have to watch this and suffer and then talk about it so that's that's the delightful thing that i get to do to people i think there's a lot here to talk about beyond the on-screen suffering and the viewing suffering i would i wouldn't describe my viewing of it as the first time as that i needed to suffer through it um I, i think you need to you need to get into the mindset like i'm about to watch a horror film uh, and I, I specifically chose the the non-rated version to watch, and thinking that like you know what like I, I I you you tune your brain to the setting of like you're gonna get that's you're you're gonna tune it to a different setting than Toy Story three that's for sure or or <laughs> or you're you're gonna tune it to the all right prepare my mind for the stuff that you see, and I found myself being um, pleasantly shocked and. and and surprised at like the high quality of the swings that this movie takes like like when they go for it they go for it and it's it's almost always successful uh, i was prepared to see them go for go for stuff that doesn't hit that doesn't land and while there might be a couple instances there uh this was and for a short movie um it was they managed to pack in a lot of a lot of really cool stuff to watch absolutely So before we talk and spoil this movie for you, we're going to take a quick break for some ads, but join us back again if, for whatever reason, you haven't seen this movie. We posted it up on Facebook ahead of time. Check it out. It is free right now as of October 18th on Amazon Prime. So free movie, short movie, check it out, and we'll be right back. What happens when two modern film fans go back and rewatch all the old classic films from yesteryear to see if they hold up? You get the Classic Film Jerks podcast. Find the Classic Film Jerks podcast on all the major platforms. Welcome to the Flashback Flicks Retro Movie Podcast. I'm Ricky. I'm Grayson. And every week we review a movie from the past and reflect on things we missed, things we loved, and things we want to see again. Yeah, because we believe any movie worth watching is worth watching again. So if you like films, friendship, and a lot of callbacks, I mean, just so many callbacks, then subscribe on Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or wherever RSS feeds go for like-minded, movie-loving individuals. Like you. And we're back. So final warning here, if you haven't seen 2009, The Loved Ones. Dustin is going to spoil it for you, and there's a lot to go on to spoil. So you've been warned. Dustin, can you break it down for us? So much so that I I don't think I can break it down, break (laughs) down everything. I can't break down everything. Um, There's a lot in this this movie. So we'll start here with troubled teen Brent is recovering from a car accident that resulted in the death of his father as he was driving. In doing so, he turns to isolation and you know, smoking pot to get away from his home life. Uh, his girlfriend, Holly, provides emotional support, but his mother has since become afraid of motor vehicle travel or just afraid of inexperienced drivers. Uh, he's at the school and politely turns down an invitation to the end of school dance by Lola Stone um, and is later uh, traversing the outback, just kind of getting away from it all. When he is kidnapped by her father to attend a private, more intimate party full of torture, mutilation, and lobotomy, as we learn that Lola has been trying unsuccessfully to find the right prince for her grotesque love story. Those who have failed in the past have had their brains boiled and turned into a cannibalistic monster by Daddy and his power tools, uh, which would be Brent's fate if he didn't use what remains of his wits to get free from his binds, end daddy's life, and escape back to Australian civilization before Lola comes hunting for him. Holly and Lola duke it out before yet another vehicle accident leaves Lola maimed and hungry only for vengeance, crawling down the road with knife in hand, resulting in the two teen lovers ending her spree of terror with a well-placed car bumper headshot. Brent and Holly are reunited with his mom afterwards, and 
I guess that's the end of this uh, of this forlorn love story. Oh, even even in that summary, I mean, you're, we're going to talk about more of the the horrible things that go on, but that's a lot to take in. So, Dustin, you started off this summary. This movie is really a tale of grief and how Brent and we have a character named Mia as well, uh, who's a side character, are dealing with grief. And I I don't know about you, but for me, that's what elevates this movie past a lot of the things that we just touch on in this summary is seeing Brent struggle with grief and his struggle with, honestly, the will to live. Yeah, yeah, uh, that is um, a, a, a really important backstory to uh, the characters in this movie. Uh, there's sometimes the, the people that are subjected to the, the real meat of the movie are just on a trip, we'll say. Or, you know, they are renting a cabin out there or they are just in the middle of what you might consider a normal days, a, more, a normal life's day. Or it just sort of uh, the circumstances would happen that they run into the monster. Uh, in this situation, we, we do have, uh, even in the brief amount of time, a good picture of uh, Brent feeling uh, whether he feels fully responsible for uh, the death of his father we know that he deals with whether it's pressure or just the the sight of his mom. I guess we, we can presume that his mom was not in that sort of near catatonic state of just sitting in her chair with her spirits looking out the window. Maybe she was different before the accident happened leading to uh, dad's passing. Um, he is, we know that he has turned to cutting um, cutting his own body with uh, the razor blade that he keeps uh, around his, like on a chain around his neck. We know that like the, the home life is struggling. Uh, his, his relationship with Holly doesn't seem to have any type of downturn. Uh, but I guess what's interesting about this is that we know they are in a relationship. Like they start off as boyfriend and girlfriend, as partners. Uh, but he, we, we are seeing his near choice to end his own life as he's uh, rock climbing out in the uh, out in the desert. So uh, you you do have a, a good picture of just this one character, uh, just his struggle with even continuing to live on. Um, things aren't peachy for his life, but he's he's got some aspects. He's got a best friend. He's got a girlfriend. Uh, I suppose he's, you know, halfway through school or maybe nearing the end. Um, and then tragedy befalls and he's living with it in the middle of what ends up being the main focus of this movie. So it's, it's, it's something where sometimes you don't get a full psychological picture of, uh, we'll say, the victims in horror movies. Right. And in this case, we do. Yeah, it's not this isn't a movie where a bunch of teens are smoking weed in a cabin and all of a sudden you hear, kew, 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 ah, ah. you know, this, <laughs> right. there's, there's great setup. And in even his relationship with Holly, she gets this sweet card from Brent and she's looking at it when Brent has already been abducted and they're just saying, Oh, he's done it before. And Holly knows something's up. The card says you've done what all the King's men couldn't do. And it's putting him back together again. So, yeah, his his guilt over his father. And we have this side story as well with Mia. Uh, it turns out the individual, the escaped individual that Brent is swerving to miss that winds up killing his father was Mia's brother. And right. we've it's an odd thing when you're going through this viewing the first time because you have this side story with a best friend and it serves as almost a relief to you know, we've got drills happening to Brent we've got uh, bleach in the vocal cords salt in literal salt in wounds just horrible mm. horrible things and then they're cutting cutting to a school dance where Jamie and me are banging heads uh, they're getting a little frisky and kicked out by uh, honestly a pretty cool supervisor that's he's pretty lax yeah. about things they are uh, they are inappropriate on the floor and he's just like uh -huh. go do something 
somewhere else. You're like, where is this going other than relief? And then it hits us. Yeah, that that B story is is something that I think I would have liked developed a little bit more. Yeah. Um, but but and, and I think there could have been more time. I mean, we do know that we're only dealing with four million dollars. Um, but that that is it's it's not particularly a distraction, but it is uh, sort of juxtaposed within the scenes of agony uh, that when, when you cut to that, you, you there's there's a reason that we're focusing on this. It's not for solely comedic effect. Um, I, I think if it weren't for like upon like I I didn't rewatch the whole movie. I rewatched it uh, like certain scenes of it. If you had known that that is, that is the the brother right away, then maybe it changes how you view this Mia character. But I will say like that B story, if it's more fleshed out, this this movie even becomes better than I already hold it in pretty good esteem. Uh, that, that and that's that's something where people in this area have disappeared, and the the um, the amount of connections in this movie are not random. Um, every everybody is is connected through more than just uh, French friendship or uh, propinquity to one another. There's there's several strings attached. Right. Yeah. You we learn later that Mia has gone into this gothic phase and almost this kind of self destruction because of her brother. So that's she is as you pointed out the juxtaposition to Brent of this is how she's dealing with her grief and how she's dealing with her loss. And her, her dad is the one that has to look for Brent. He is the, the sheriff or some, some form of police officer. Yeah. So we've, we've got that story. We, we've beaten around the bush, but let's, let's talk about these characters in the stone household. We have a very interesting assortment with bright eyes who we we come to know is the mother we have daddy which there's an interesting relationship and then we have lola mm -hmm. yeah and the this particular household uh, and we learn we luckily we we are introduced to like her ways and daddy's ways in the middle of just the graphic images on the screen is that we learn more about what their game is and let, and let me try to just put it together. Uh, since a very, very young age, I guess answer answer this question for me. Did, how much of this was just what Lola wanted um, and Daddy being an accessory? Or did Daddy uh, begin this sort of search for the right prince for his princess and then she buys into it? Do you have an answer for that? I didn't find that I was like needing that answer. It seemed like they were a good um, pairing of <clears throat> psychopaths. <laughs> right. um, but I, I didn't find that like one was really leading the other. They were they were a good team in what they did, considering they've been doing this for, I must assume, something like over seven years uh, with the number of people that had disappeared. Did you think one was leading the other? That's a really good question because some of it almost seems more on Lola's side. The incest incestuous relationship, there's some degree of hesitation from the father figure. Yeah. And not enough. Oh, by the way, we're adding incest to this horrible movie. Uh, <laughs> yeah. We didn't yeah. mention that. But yeah, there's, he obviously has sexual feelings for his daughter and but he's not trying to reciprocate but she says well it's always been you that's why no one can compare you're my prince so i i think to some extent the tail is wagging the dog here like he's trying to find someone that isn't him for her and it just keeps Ooh. getting rejected Good point. Yeah, is is that um, maybe when they find the right prince, uh, he I don't know what his next step is after that, but maybe he can stop this. Is is that maybe part of his plan? Is that if we do find the right one, it it, it, it is there is a goal in mind. Yes. We, we, the goal is find find the right one for my little princess. And when we now then <laughs> maybe maybe not exactly on the same linear path towards that goal. Well, if we don't find the right one, we don't just discard 
this person, this would-be prince, this suitor. No, we are going to take the power drill and lobotomize them. And then through a process of boiling water, maybe it's just as simple as that, uh, boil their brains up so that they become cannibalistic monsters that we keep underneath the house. That's the rest of the household gang. Uh, <laughs> aside from Bright Eyes, the mother, Daddy, and Lola, the princess, we've got, what is it, three? Yes. Three still living, we'll use living in air quotes, monsters living under the house. That just seems secondary. Like, oh, we're just going <laughs> to keep the, this is, uh, it's, it's not as if they... Um, it's not as if they, they use them in any way. Uh, they, they aren't setting them loose to prey upon the town. They just stay down there. It is a huge uh, coup for the movie. It was like, oh, we can get even creepier than we were. We can get even creepier in that we're just going to keep these uh, emaciated corpse-like zombie people surviving on the remains of other people. Uh, it, it is. It added the to the overall factor of the movie but i don't know if there was ever really a goal for them do do we think that bright eyes was like the best version that they had done before were they were they improving on their results of their of their their medical procedure i i think the whole we just don't want to deal with bodies but there's 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 some degree of power and control like this is clearly influenced by jeffrey dahmer this was a method of Jeff, Jeffrey Dahmer's serial killing. He would lobotomize someone and pour acid in the hole in their head, and it mm. would put them in close to a catatonic state. So we we have this movie using hot water to do it, and they actually they give you a fake out of oh we missed, but then we we do it and we do it twice. We, we don't get the hot water in. I think this is the only movie where I can say it starts with bleach being injected to vo into vocal cords, and then it gets worse. Like, <laughs> yeah, I, I can't think of another movie, to your point, okay, all these horrible things. We've got knives through Brent's feet to keep him from running away after he, he almost got away. You're, you're cheering so hard, like, please get out of here. She carves her initials in a giant heart in his chest with a fork. And then we discover his ultimate fate is to just become this feral animal living yeah. under the house, eating scraps of you know, dead policemen or whomever <laughs> they, they managed to kill. There's a lot here uh, in, in what you just described. And, and uh, kudos to the movie uh, for having the depth beyond – Something like um, one of my favorite horror movies. Actually, we have not talked about this, Chad, is uh, House of a Thousand Corpses, mm. that first Rob Zombie foray. I have actually never seen The Devil's Rejects. I know people like that one more. I do not. Uh, but I, House of a Thousand Corpses uh, is one of those like, all right, these people are on a trip. They show up and then this family does bad things to them. Um, in this situation, we've got we've got a lot of depth. So you, you, you mentioned the um, the knives through the feet of brent brent is already going in his grief like you so aptly put through like like self mutilation you know cutting himself we see that he is not accepting the conditions of this torture the way that princess and daddy would want now he's still in pain uh, we hear him scream a lot in this movie um but the the idea that like the knives are in the feet, and he's kind of looking up. He's not really challenging them back, but what he's showing is that like this isn't this isn't going to result in what you want. He did, did you pick up on that? That he's I mean I, I feel like the audience has to and that like you can't hurt me through this way. Oh yeah. I already do this to myself, and I don't think I've ever seen that in a movie in a horror movie. Yeah, kudos to Xavier Samuel because he doesn't have any dialogue after 27 minutes. He, <laughs> yep. He's got screaming because his vocal cords were destroyed, and it's just this horrendous sound. So kudos to the sound mixing too. But his eye acting, you're right. When Lola is straddling him as they're nailing these knives to his feet, she's screaming in his face, cry, 
cry and he is looking down and this was a brilliant scene it may come up later you may hear more from uh -huh. he lifts his eyes to match hers and just glares back and i i really think given all the other background that we have his his grief his depression you you just see in that one scene all right he's got a desire to live he is going to defy this it's he's not giving up so you're right he's not giving them what they want and there's frustration from robin mclevy is she is an absolute psychopath in this movie she she flits from extremely immature teenager to mocking brent as her father has a hammer and nail situated above his member as uh yeah uh, because he needed to go to the bathroom which by the way i have a shy bladder that is not happening i i guess i get the nail and the hammer but yeah that's that's performance under pressure for him that uh, e even the 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 acting that is you know accompanied by zero dialogue zero actual lines the ability to show relief uh, not just in the relief of the bladder but relief in the like I, I did it. I was able to avoid pain in this way. There, that was uh, really well shot and, and very much like, okay, he's he's fighting. When just 20 minutes earlier, he was considering, as you mentioned, considering letting go of the cliffside and falling to his doom. You know, that, that might be easy in his mindset, mindset to say, yeah, I'm just going to just going to let go. And we do see like a little bit of the fear of, of falling, but yeah, he, he does turn into like, no, I'm going to live and I'm going to uh, fight for myself. And it's, I don't think it's like a heroic fight, right? It's not like a, a, a knight fighting against an enemy and having to show his resolve to get the backing of his army. It's not, it's not heroic or bravery in that sense. It's a self-internalized, uh, I am not going to end it here. I'm going to keep fighting. And we see him. We see him show that resolve, uh, nearly getting away once, kind of midway, and then uh, you know we we get our second breakout, using the implement, using the tool he uses to hurt himself, uh, yeah. which, it, it, like, what what you can tell about this movie is that they did not include that he is a cutter and that whole he you know we see that scene where he grips his razor blade and lets the blood go down his hand. We don't include that for edgy flavor. We include that because it's part of who Brent is um, and, and what he has to deal with. And that uh, it can be then turned to his tool that saves his own life and stops this whole entire spree is, is something that like, I have to wait until we do the podcast, y'all. I have to wait until we're, I'm talking with Chad and Brian and Russell and Nathan. I have to wait until we're talking about it to really appreciate some of this stuff. That's awesome to turn that tool into, you know, the, the thing that saves him. Yeah. Yeah, it really is. Mm -hmm. And it, it adds more meaning. It's not just one of those checkoffs guns type things of, oh, you see this earlier. It has meaning in his life. It has tragedy associated with it and you know i gotta throw another person out here john brumpton who plays daddy my goodness i i think he just did a wonderful job too i don't know i'm not an actor but i i've done scripts and plays and things like that but the the places he had to go during this film and the way he nails some of the steps that he's got to do like He's checking out what's supposed to be his daughter dressing. And there's just this awkward, pervy look in his eye. And you can, you can tell there's conflict. So this daddy character, while he's teaching her to use the drill and not to go too deep, or he's bringing out those little uh, party blowers. I don't know what they're called. I've had this conversation before. I don't know if anybody has... Uh a name for those except for just like a, a blower. Yeah. Um, and, and I actually had this conversation with friends here in town uh, a couple months ago and uh, they were like, Dustin, you know stuff. What are those called? And without missing a beat, I was like, that's called a poplin. 
Uh, th th those are called party poplins. So I've been so I've been calling them poplins since then. I, I don't think there's any other like official name for those things. That that was the saddest use of a poplin. <laughs> we'll go with that word. We'll make it official that yeah. I've ever seen. Of you know they give it to Brent and they're saying hey celebrate with us and so he's having to celebrate this. It's not prom because it's taking place in Australia, but it's like an end, end of year, end of school dance, something yeah. like that. Mm -hmm. I do wonder, Anne Scott Pendleberry, she's the one that did Bright Eyes. You mentioned it before, of she might have been the test subject. She's implied to be the mother. I, I kind of wish in an 87 minute movie we had gotten more background about her or even some flashlight back, see something. Because my question was immediately, okay, was this daddy that did it? Was it Lola that drove it? Like, What happened that Bright Eyes had to be lobotomized? Yeah, um, I, I, I think upon first hearing that question, I would say there may have been the moment where daddy was willing to dote on daughter enough to where daughter would say something along the lines of princess would say like, you're spending too much time with mom, or I need you to focus on me, not her. And the decision was made to turn her into a vegetable, in a sense. Uh, but that's sort of the other cool, uh, one of the other many cool things about this movie is that we don't really know. And because we don't know, it can be any number of things. Uh, it, it almost confuses the decision for her to snuff her life out with the pillow later on. Because we don't really know why she's there. Is she there just to be humiliated by Princess? Another aspect of the the torture, the mutilation. A word, humiliation is the word I couldn't come up with when I was writing the, the <laughs> plot summary. But they're they're teasing him. She she's playing some mind games with him. She she is. Aside from the tendencies towards the violence and the marking with the with the you know the. Uh, heart with the initials in the middle. She's kind of playing around, like like we she she seems in many ways underdeveloped, which adds to uh, the the atrocities that she and she commits. It makes it seem as if like to to maybe a child's brain, like getting what they want is more important than we'll say morals or ethics. You know, we don't know how far along Kohlberg's uh, levels she is. So like there, it's I think it's if there's enough left out to fill in the gaps, probably left purposefully uh, there. I, I, as far as Bright Eyes is concerned, like she she just adds as like, oh, this is just scary. She's silent sitting there at dinner. They're, they're humiliating her by like, you know, throwing milk in her mouth. And uh, I think it's just another plaything for her. And, and daddy's going to do everything he can to make his princess happy, which is making me think that maybe the first actor in doing something awful is, is based on like daddy just trying to make princess happy. Even the way I'm saying that, I don't know. Like that's a guess. Like, and and it's still even even though I don't know, it's still pretty great. Like to wander around what they were thinking. I like your theory and wish to subscribe to your newsletter. Yeah, this is. You're right. I think some of the things being left unsaid. What what are the intent for the feral? We'll call them boyfriends or boy play <laughs> things. What. What, yeah. what really happened to Bright Eyes? You know, could this happen? It, it does kind of add to the fear. There's just, there's so much going on. And I, I do think you've probably hit it on the head of, this was probably an argument with Lola that descended into Daddy having to make the decision between Lola, his princess, and Bright Eyes, his wife. We never find out her real name or anything right. like that. It seems to be a fairly small town, so disappointed in the sheriff a little bit of not being like, hey, what happened to your wife, Daddy? We haven't seen her in town in a little bit. Like, What's up with that? But uh, yeah, yeah, we've we've got a lot of great character acting here. 
Yeah. And, and, and Lola is at school. She's not isolated. Right. She's at school. I think she's likely a 16 or 17 year old that's acting like a 12 year old. So not like, like a, like a really young child, but I'm going to say like more like middle school age, you know, the pink colors, um, the, the heavy use of makeup. There's actually a great detail uh, later on where you notice that her nails are actually like plastic stick ons. Yes. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, And so like, she's, she's like uh, Lisa Frank's worst nightmare. Uh, (laughs) I like that. Uh, yeah, and 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 so she's got, but she exists in society. I guess the major opposite of kudos to the the, the constable or the cop or the sheriff, whatever Mia's dad's role is. There have been a lot of missing people right. over the last ten years, seven years, ten years, and we do learn where they all went. There's not another guy doing it. This this is this is the the result, and and we learn that like. They've done it before, uh, and that's when we get our maybe our first little glimpse of like awkward humor when they open the trunk, and Lola's kind of upset that Brent isn't moving, and I think the first line you hear Daddy say is, "Oh no, I, d- I didn't use too much, did I? Right. Like, he's, like, did I mess this up? Did I screw up?" Uh, there's a lot of that in this movie, which I I I am almost hesitant to use this word, but like. It makes it it makes their relationship and it makes the whole movie more charming that they they're not perfect calculated killers. They are just doing their best to execute this plan of getting a good date and eventual husband for princess. And they mess it up sometimes. <laughs> it, it was really in 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 all uh, that that makes that makes their existence as the bad guys more enjoyable is that, is that sometimes the whether it's a hero or villain is like unerring or too good and they are they they don't know anything like they're they're just figuring it out and they figured out some things really well uh tying knots uh, you know may, maybe uh that's why they had to turn to knives instead of just knots yeah so they, they're just figuring it out there's a lot of you mentioned humor. There's a lot of subtle humor. Like they stop for hot wings after abducting <laughs> Brent, which is not something you should generally do. Like he's in their trunk. They stop for hot wings. They also hit a possum on the side of the road and he stops and picks that up. So there's a uh-huh. lot of like subtle things. We talked about the poplin in the mouth. There's the crown has has a sound effect. They they sprinkle in humor in this movie in places where you recognize oh my goodness this is awful this is absolutely awful what just happened but they're saying sing for your supper and there's just this horrible ah, stuff Mm -hmm. going on in the background so yeah sean Byrne does a good job and he gives us hope twice Uh, you know the the first time brent escapes and he escapes into the tree We've got a great scene where he's rolling under the car and trying to get out. And you think, all right, he's going to make it, and we're just going to go into somewhere different. And then we have the rock-throwing scene. Yeah. Hey, you know, imagine imagine if that's the first time he gets away, and this movie is no longer about Brent's personal torture inside the room. Imagine if they unleash the, the zombified, lobotomized ex-boyfriends imagine if they could give them orders like go hunt down princess's next bow oh, and then and then they release these monsters into the into the town it's a completely different movie but at least it would give them some type of purpose i'm not trying to like like change the the entire out course of the movie but like that could have happened you you don't know any what direction this is going and and it's not a um it, this is this is a just a cross section of something that they've already been doing, and what you learn is that Brent, it's not you, it's not you. Uh, I thought that you were the one that I had my eye on, but no, um, we're gonna keep finding, or we're gonna keep searching, and you're just gonna become one of the others. I think normally in these movies, the victim is maybe like the culmination of the search. 
or it's like, oh, no, you're the special one and we're going to keep you on forever and in your own personal torture. No, it's like now we're moving on. Uh, we're going to find someone else right. um, to, to where if, if the movie ended, you know, they're still going to be out there doing their thing. But, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the there's there's a um, there's a, a delight for daddy and princess like tossing the rocks up at the up at Brent in the tree um, of the like, they're having fun with this particular aspect. Did you notice, like, Daddy's not panicking when he gets away? Right. Yeah, he's like, all right, well, let me start the car. Go look for him. I, I don't know how, how far away they are from anything else. It must be quite far, considering, like, oh, he's, he's – we'll find him. He's not going to be able to go to the neighbors and get help, for instance. Right, yeah, that's that's the chilling part is they're, they're not in a hurry. This is a game, and we're going to make a game of chucking things at him to knock him out of a tree. And they eventually do, and that leads to horrific things. But then then we're given hope again with the sheriff. The sheriff shows up, doesn't call for backup, as sheriffs do in horror movies. <laughs> um, yeah. Never recommend when you think there's someone been being abducted and that you've located the house and you can smell death. But nevertheless, our sheriff shows up. And bad things happen to him. Yeah, he he um, with, with that particular moment, we have he only knew to go there based on Holly's remembering that Brent turned down Lola at the high school, and she remembers that because we we do get a good picture of what's everybody else doing during the torture of Brent. Right. Having a good time. <laughs> they they are they are uh, you know some of them are, are are searching. You have Holly and Brent's mother kind of working together. You can tell there's a good relationship there, or at least maybe there wasn't one before, because because we learned that Brent's mother didn't want Brent getting into the vehicle with Holly after she got her driver's license. Right. So the trauma kind of brought to maybe opposing forces together for a little bit. We find it. We find out that the you know the cop heads over there, but does I, the, the the cop never solves it. He's just another victim in this instance, uh, a, a, a tertiary victim, a side victim because nobody was supposed to show up to this place. So he he ends up just getting uh, brained with either a meat cleaver or a knife. Sorry, man. Uh, this is more they're just a casualty of this story. Yeah, adds more to Mia's tragedy though, because that's her dad. Oh yikes! Yeah. Yeah, uh, tough situation for her. There's almost, there's really, there's really nothing that makes Mia's situation better no. through the whole. And that's where this, that's where the B story needs more development, right? Right. Uh, yeah, um, and maybe that's maybe that's my number one overall critique here is, um, I thought, what is his name, Jamie, the, yes. like the best friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, uh, I've never seen this actor before. Probably never see him again. Most of these actors aren't in anything else that we would see. Right. Um, but hey, you know, he's excited that Mia said yes to go to the dance, and he's wearing a tuxedo T-shirt, and he's spraying cologne on himself, and he, he's he's making the you know the little short little quips, the 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 quick jokes. That it's it's not enough to be a distraction, but like that's kind of a welcome part of the charm of this movie. It's like, oh, that's kind of fun. They're, they're, we get to see them. They don't even. I mean, they, then then we get the the added strangeness of, um, I guess M- Mia's way of coping is to uh, act out really really feeling up on Jamie at uh, at the dance enough to where the other kids are like staring. Right. Um, Sex and drugs. Yeah. A, a little more development there would have been a like a more complete movie. But yeah, yeah, things don't get better for her. No. Not at all. And our, our director here, his name is Sean Byrne. He has only directed two movies, but if you've seen The Devil's Candy, this feels like a Sean Byrne movie. And they're very, very different. But why I say it feels like a Sean Byrne movie is he has a preference for very, very tight shots, very, very much character development, and he uses metal music. So at big times in this movie, 
he is kicking in the metal music. We talked about Brent's Defiance, and there's metal music kicking in. During the escape, there's metal, and he just uses music to amp up. It reminds me of another horror movie that I've seen called The Green Room. Sean doesn't have anything to do with that, but he uses it sparingly, but for key moments in the film. Yeah, the um, I, I actually looked up the I, I when I finished streaming it, I went back and uh, looked at like the music used uh, aside from the metal, uh, which which was used as Brent's escape. Uh, you, you see him put his headphones in. They're all using analog headphones. Is it is it kind of strange to think that like when I saw the analog headphones, like the kind I'm wearing, where you know with the with the wire. That we're so used to seeing like Bluetooth headphones right. and like AirPods nowadays, that for a second there I was like, wow, this guy really made the decision to have these Australian people wear uh, wear, wear analog headphones. It's like, oh wait, no, that this is just what people wore at the time. <laughs> we just had these. Yeah. It's at this point of our podcast where Brian has escaped his captivity and is able to join us. Apologies, gentlemen. Oh, hey there. Uh, he's arrived. Yes. Ah! Yes, we we did specify there may be a third appearing. So we were we were talking about the use of metal in this movie, metal music to kick in. I I also don't think I'll ever listen to Taylor Swift the same again. Oh yeah, well, this is uh this is Casey Chambers, but yeah, yeah. This I can oh, see oh, they're, okay. they're very similar, okay. similar type of um you know sad guitar, uh, not getting what I want from the boys in my life. Uh, I, and we ha- we hadn't quite hit that song yet, but I, it does deserve attention. I yeah. absolutely should have looked that up ahead of time. I I knee jerk reaction went directly to Taylor Swift, and I was like, it makes sense to put something this like poppy sap to a horror. I mean, it's horrific. I I the whole time when it kept cropping up, I was just like, Ugh. I, I'm fine <laughs> with throwing Taylor Swift under the bus here, but yeah, let's talk about this. <laughs> Casey Chambers, she, this was the no, a number one song. She wrote this song as a response to not getting radio play. And as so many of those songs go, this is the one that they're like, yeah, we're going to play this over and over. It was number one in Australia. It actually did come over to the U.S. for a little bit. I wasn't aware of it until this movie. I tried to find her reaction to the loved ones. I can't find it. But now she's permanently associated, but on Am I Not Pretty Enough with a drill and a school formal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, and actually, I'll get I'll get into uh, that the like that song's importance uh, a little later with uh, in our in our superlatives. I, I think. Uh, tell me what you think about this, Fry. Um, I, I described I described Princess here as Lisa Frank's worst nightmare. Just kind of, just kind of this uh, pink glitter demon out there, and that song, uh, the, the, the many times that it's played, can be can be used in like, oh, look at the development of this girl, and then also like, ooh, this being the background as she, or actually no, she's just singing it without the music. She's singing yes. it as she's walking down the road. Very, very um, unsettling to have those two things together. I think that. The Lisa Frank cut might be over the head of some of our audience. Uh, for those who, who who get that, I I want to give you a high five. That's a that's a deep cut. I I'm I'm immediately smacked in the face with neon dolphins thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, no, that's that's perfect. She is 100 percent like third grade brain Lisa Frank folder binder carrying psycho. So. So I need to know, we're, we're probably going to have to move into our movie superlatives somewhat soon, but Brian, we, we need some impressions from you. Brian's able to join us. He is our mystery third guest, so we're excited to have him, and I have forced this movie on him. I hope you watch this with your wife as well, because it's a feel-good romance. Oh, I did. You did? Oh, I, I in, in fact, uh, once I realized my mistake on the, the timing piece, I uh, I couldn't have set up my computer fast enough because I had to get Jess's take on this too. Uh, <laughs> oh Lord! About about halfway through the movie, she started yelling at the screen, "You can't do a frontal lobotomy like that!" <laughs> oh. Like 
she got really like aggressive about the medical inadequacies of this movie all the while I'm sitting there like, really? That's, that's, that's what you have an issue with that's right now. Is- I was impressed if whoever the Foley artist was, if you had to say to me somewhere down the line, Hey Dustin, what's, um, what do you think the sound of a boar going through a skull sounds like? I'm like, I got the perfect movie for you. I've got the great. Sound I, I don't, I, I don't know. I would hope that she doesn't have that that sound memorized. So um, <laughs> I, I, I don't think that's what she took issue with. But this is something that I run into a lot. I, I'm no longer allowed to watch House because of her issues with it medically. Right. So um, for all of you, if you ever decide to uh, marry someone in the medical profession, uh, say goodbye to any medically relevant or irrelevant, as it may seem, uh, medical show, movie, theme, really anything. She will, bl- or he will blow it up for you. I mean, just burn it to the ground. So, so your your wife came away unimpressed due to medical <laughs> issues. Very interesting. How about you, Brian? Where were, I know this was a new one for you. I actually, this movie is your fault. I don't know if you know that, um, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, the last dealer's choice horror movie, I think you you used Not the word a scary. Yeah, you said it wasn't scary or memorable. I was like, all right, I'll at least do memorable. Oh yeah, it's definitely no, it's definitely memorable. It, it's it's more shock horror than it is um, actually scary. Um, it's just one of those like, oh, hope that never happens. Right. But I yeah, but I could I could see it being an option. Typically, when I watch horror movies or the horror movies that I enjoy the most are the ones that stick with me a little bit, at, not necessarily for its plausibility, but because you think, oh, that would really suck. Like that's there's there's no getting away from that. It's it's uh, uh, it follows is probably one of the, the highlights of that genre where you're like, that's a very unfortunate thing that could happen. Yes. Uh, so. Uh, obviously, this also is a very unfortunate thing that would <laughs> that could happen, but and it uh, has it, been happening. Like, right. and, and this this is the you know victim number six or seven in the look. This has happened a lot. Somebody in real life copied this movie and used oh, this movie oh, as a defense. Oh no! Yuck! That's no, I can't do that. <laughs> that's what I said. Whenever I feel like whenever I'm doing my stretches at the gym, I decide to walk on all fours upside down. I'm just like, guys, I'm just doing my my ring girl. It's a great it's a great stretching exercise. Why are you throwing me out? Let me back in. Ah. Uh, so since I'm coming in late uh, here, here's the Pat and Brian tangent. My wife has never forgiven me <laughs> for the ring. Um, she she still relatively refuses to watch. Uh, horror movies with me although the last movie i did see was the um the elder version of the fog she watched that with me okay. she typically will not do anything involving girls with draping wet hair yes yeah the grudge series is completely out uh yeah all of that i i actually had tickets to see the remake of evil dead with her thinking it was safe no, it was not. No, it was not safe. It was the opposite of safe. She ended up uh, being ill that night. So I went with a friend instead. Thank God. That's the only reason I'm here to do this partial podcast with you today. Right. right. D- with with the discussion of ring girls and grudge girls and the dripping hair, doesn't that make the, the, the presence and the, the screen presence of daddy and princess be a great like departure from that? It's like, oh, the the the. the Enemies are next door, or in this instance, they're just out in the outback. Like, oh, th- these are just people with a goal, and uh, it, it, I, I thought that was great. And then you get, you do get the body horror, scary uh, cannibals kept under the under there. But um, as as your your main uh, villains will say, I, I thought that was just. Well, I keep using words that I didn't think I'd use for this movie, but I thought it was refreshing. <laughs> right? Yeah. There, there were a lot of sentences you didn't expect to utter until you get into this podcast. Yes. Yeah. So so now that we are three, we are whole, I'm going to go into the movie superlatives. All right. We're going to do our MVP. Brian, can you help us out? Who is your MVP of The Loved Ones? 
Uh, I had John Brumpton for this one as daddy. Yes. Uh, I don't, I, I don't think that Robin McLevy even came close to as creepy as the dad was. Um, I feel like watching it, Robin was, I, I, I don't want to say mailing in. I, I'll go the opposite. I think she was trying really hard to be creepy. Whereas John Brumpton just came across as, yep, I'm naturally creepy. I'm, I might nail you to a chair with a, uh, a kitchen knife. Oh yeah. Yeah, the casual creepiness of bringing out uh, the hammer and nail for the urination dude, scene. It's just like, it oh. was it was so easy. It yes. looked so easy for him. Yeah. Like, yes. I, yeah. In fact, it still gives me chills a little bit. You tell another human being as they're drilling, don't go too far. Like, Remember, push and don't go too far. Ooh, yeah, great choice. Dustin, how about you? My, my MVP here is actually uh, Xavier Samuel, uh, only for the reason that what you mentioned earlier, like 27 movies in, he doesn't talk anymore. He acts through uh, like his, his physical body and screaming, and uh, being able to portray that emotion without lines was uh, a challenge, I'm certain, for him, um, And but it came off as a triumph. I think he did a great job. So... Like like this this is MVP not best actor right? right but I decided like that that's the thing that'll stand out uh, to, to me in in the, the future of like uh, if if you can tell a flat performance and then you can also tell like a oh, wow that this person really went for it and went all out and I I feel like that happened with uh, with Brent so yeah Xavier Samuel for me good choice I'm I'm always I'm always gonna remember that you gave MVP to a Twilight alumnus I didn't know he was in Twilight. Uh, until afterwards, until afterwards. But uh, hey, uh, <laughs> uh, I, nothing, nothing against the series. I saw one. I heard Muse. Muse is in that in that right. that first movie. I like that, right? So uh, do, they, I don't have and, to watch the rest of it. <laughs> I don't have, have to watch the they, rest of those movies. I will admit they have remarkably good soundtracks. We will. Uh, there we go. We may touch on Twilight here in a second. Uh, my MVP is mm-hmm. Robin McLevy. I can't think of another indie film where an actor or actress just nails their part like Robin nails Lola. She's unhinged, but she's naive. It's just the perfect storm of bat crap crazy. And I'm here for it. So, you know, $4 million gets you this. All right. Come on, Australia. Give me more of this. Australia, man. There's something in the water over there. She nailed it. (laughs) <laughs> she nailed it, and, and a couple iterations later, uh, you know, had this movie not turned out, she eventually would be the one doing the nailing, too. Daddy Daddy yeah. is uh, instructing on how to do all the jobs, and Daddy's still taking care of the nailing for now, but eventually she'll get to that later. Oh, thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, your best supporting actor. Uh, I went with Richard Wilson on this. I, I really like him on it. Uh, he, he actually is my uh, recast as well, so I want to, like... I, I loved how he did it, and I will tell you why I also want to see someone else. Okay. Yeah, Richard Wilson was Jamie the best friend. I liked him, too. So, Dustin, who, who have you got as your best supporting? Well, it's, it's best supporting, but it's still just – I think it's just best, best actor in general here was, was John Brumpton. That, that's why he, he, he deserves an accolade, um, and I, I think uh, his, his acting, uh, the, the conflict that we're able to see – um, in looking at his daughter, but also knowing that he must not, and that like the goal in mind, as we referenced earlier, was like maybe eventually he can escape this. Yeah, mm-hmm. that that is only seen, or that is only us thinking about those options because of the great job he did in that role. So uh, he gets that award for me. Yeah, just the character instructions play a sadistic, incestual pervert, and he's like, I got it, I got you. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I will say that I'm, I'm I'm very happy they spared us any of that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They they hint at it and it's awful enough. So I I did go with John Brompton as well for all the reasons that Fry and Dustin have mentioned. He just he does a great job. He he also nails this performance and I'm going to keep using the word nails. I will not back off of it. <laughs> hidden, <laughs> hidden gem, Brian. Uh, my my hidden gem, it's not so hidden because she's front face, you know, in it. But Robin McLevy, I, I didn't realize who she was until the movie started. But I, I was a huge fan of um, Hell on Wheels, yes, the TV series. So I was like, oh, 
it's her. And that led me to, dude, how old is she? She's 28 in this movie. So I, it, it struck me how young she must have been for Hell on Wheels. She doesn't look all that different. She's aging very well. So hats off to her for that. So, yeah, it, it struck me because I was like, oh, I, I really had never seen her in anything else. So seeing her in this, I was like, oh, man, that's, you know, girl from the Irish girl from Hell on Wheels. Yep. Yep. Dustin, who have you you got for your best supporting or your hidden gem? I'm sorry. For my, for my hidden gem, I, I guess. See, I, I was I was thinking about any other things that were hidden in there. But I think I'm just going to go with, like, Richard Wilson's performance was exactly what you needed in the movie and not more, not less with the movie as it is. If we had expanded upon the B story and got him and Mia more involved, I think it would have, like, we had a lot to potentially reach for or want there. But for the for the way that the movie's like just currently set up, uh, I I love the small amount of time that he's in, um, and I guess I do think it's kind of funny that he specifically uh, asks if Brent needs a raincoat, which I hadn't heard that in a while, calling yes. a yeah, calling a condom a raincoat, um, but uh, specifically saying like, yeah, I, <laughs> uh, it's never gonna get any use if I keep it. <laughs> I, thought yeah. I thought that was a funny joke, and then he ends up uh, you know being in a great situation later in that regards, in that teen regards. So I'm just gonna give my hidden gem to him. Okay. All right, good choice. I went with the teacher who keeps breaking up, me and Jamie. <laughs> His name's Leo Taylor. His part's very funny. He's very stern, but also pretty cool. Of, you know, I meant away from the school as he's knocking on the door, <laughs> interrupting them, having sex, shooing them out of the dance. Like, yeah, yeah, he was, he was fun. Yeah, I'm. Yeah. I'm sure you guys already talked about this, but I think that was probably. My, I don't want to say favorite in a positive way, storyline of the the movie was the fact that you come to find out she's one of the people who is missing oh, yeah. a, sig- a significant other. And I, I'd say that there's probably no one I wish had not died more than her dad. Right. Yeah. Like that was... That was that was particularly uh, that, that was particularly deep dark side of this movie. Yeah, yeah, things don't get better for her. Yeah, this entire movie is just one big dialogue about grief, and Mia Mia winds up the biggest loser in this one. That's for sure. Uh, recast, Brian. So I wanted to be sure to give Richard Wilson my supporting superlative, just to know that that I do like how he portrayed this, but the entire movie, I was thinking Rupert Grint, Rupert Grint. Yes. Oh, this, yeah. this part was made for Ron <laughs> Weasley. This part was made for Ron Weasley. Like it was screaming in my face the entire time. He did it great. I'm not belittling that at all. I got to see it with Harry Potter's best friend. I like it. I like it a lot. That's interesting. Dustin, who, who are you recasting? I'm going to say a name and uh, the, there's a movie that particularly like makes me think of casting this actor in the role. And I want to see if you guys can maybe guess the movie I'm thinking of. Um, my recast is Aubrey Plaza. Okay. As who would you think? I would think Mia. Uh, as, yeah. oh, so you're thinking as Mia. I was actually thinking as Lola princess mm. uh, Aubrey Plaza in that role. And I'm specifically thinking of a 2017 movie here where she played kind of an unhinged character. Life After Beth? I was actually thinking Ingrid Goes West. Okay. Uh, but I, th- I think that uh, this this actress actually, or sorry, this actor really does uh, like share a little bit of a resemblance to her. And I thought that um, that, that Aubrey Plaza could really um, like add, add a little bit here. I, I, I don't think that it was lacking, but I, I think that would be a cool recast there. She does weird like no one else, that's for sure. Yeah, and she and she's my age. Yes. Yeah, you know, <laughs> I'm gonna recast Jessica McNamee who plays Mia. I thought she did a great job. I thought everyone did a great job. We've been through that. But if I'm inserting someone to seem kind of dour and sad, I'm going to the Twilight Well and going with Kristen Stewart. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. That's good. I can see that. Right. Did anybody have like a mole moment with her where you're just like mole? 
No. <laughs> no. Oh, she's, she's gorgeous. So no. Nice to meet you, Mo. Oh. So, so, the, so the next two uh, best, I'm just going to do air quotes and you'll have to pretend. Best shot, Brian. Uh, I like the pan up to police dad looking into the pit before he takes an implement to the face. Oh, many. <laughs> yes. Okay. All right. That's, yeah. What a horrific here's the reality and he's just like i am well in over my head we discussed he did not call for backup the classic horror oh dude jess was in, on the couch going why aren't you calling for backup right you should call for backup yep. it's insanity you're not calling for backup what kind of cop are you call for backup i mean just over and over and over again it's a small town he's he's on a budget it's he's just in. him this this is clearly why he couldn't find him right Dustin, what is your best shot of this movie? Uh, mine is also about an implement to not the face in this instance, the neck. Uh, I, I mentioned that, you know, or we talked about how there's very little uh, lines for, for Brent, for uh, Xavier, uh, Samuel, as, as we go through the movie. But I think we get a POV shot of him attacking daddy as he's stabbing him in the neck. Yes, and you get, you get And you get his teeth. You get You get like his rage at that moment. It, right, right. This is immediately after he throws the drill at the face, which has a great impact sound. So like that that shot of the, the POV shot of this uh, long haired teenager in a tux dripping, dripping in blood, uh, shambling towards you because his, there's knife wounds in his feet. That's an awesome shot from yeah. his point of view with the metal kicking in. Yes. Yeah. For me, it's the dash cam during Brent's escape. I feel like that's exhilarating. It's insanely tense as daddy's just chasing him down pretty slowly in the car and you're just tracking brent so that that to me that was the most horror-esque part of this movie for me so i enjoyed it the best scene again air quotes best scene brian um i'm actually going to go with the attempted escape too uh just the whole part of them prancing around under a tree throwing rocks at him right. i was like is this is this really where we are right now and then the fact that one lands and then he falls out of the tree i was like this poor guy <laughs> it just got like, he worse. can't catch a break yeah <laughs> if you can dodge a wrench you can dodge a ball yeah. <laughs> dude i i actually said that while we were watching <laughs> just was like what and i was like you gotta watch dodgeball right <laughs> dustin, dustin what's your best scene it's the father-daughter dance. Okay, all right. Uh, Am I not pretty enough? <laughs> you get a little bit of that. You get um, his. You get daddy's reluctance as to what it is that um, you know princess wants. Uh, you top it off with the. Uh, you've got the handmade banner in the back. You've got the awesome like act like disco ball for real that's doing the lighting effect, and then you because you, you might be focusing on the idea that this is another instance where Brent is trying to escape, but it's, you're also getting like, he's being forced to watch this just feet away from, yes. from what's going on. Uh, another just increase in the creepiness of this movie. And mine, I, I talked about it earlier, but when Brent is getting the knives hammered through his feet and Lola is straddling him, and this is just awful to describe, but, She's screaming, cry, 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 and he lifts his eyes, and the metal music kicks in and just glares at her. He's got that fight. So, yeah, for me, that was his triumphant moment. Best wardrobe or makeup? There's a lot going on here. Brian? I'm going to go with the prom dress. I feel like the bubblegum pink really uh, solidifies the, the horror of this. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I it, it drips wanna be can't have gonna kill you excellent mm. dustin uh mine's mine was gonna be the the bloody tux but i'm, I'm gonna jump on the, the same situation the same uh wardrobe that that fry did which is that like that that dress specifically the moment that he uh that daddy gives her the dress and the shoes um that like this is uh, like important for him it's important for her plus we do get to see that like what, what does she say? Like, hold on, let me change. You'll have to tell me how it looks. And that's when you first start to see that conflict of like, ugh. Now, now we're getting deeper again. Uh, like he's he's looking at his daughter undress and then redress. Mm -hmm. it, it's um, I, I I was waiting for and didn't get where like she would have maybe said, 
and she still has the thing we consider like underdeveloped but i could have seen her saying like will you come zip me up and that would have been an awesome like like ch- uh chance or opportunity to show that like more of that conflict in daddy like do i want to go over there and get close mm-hmm. like it would have had if you were watching it in theaters you would have started squirming like no don't go over you're already looking don't get close don't yeah. touch her it's it's it was very much like yeah I, I see where this is going and i don't like it i'm gonna make it three for three it's right up yep. there uh, with Kate Hudson's yellow dress and How to Lose a Guy there in you 10 go. Days. It's iconic. So, yes, this is an iconic horror wardrobe. Great, great choice here. I also like handcuffing this movie to that movie, just <laughs> just, just for, our, for our listeners. Like, never, ever watch this rom-com without thinking about this. Well, and let's, let's uh, speaking of handcuffing, let's uh, and speaking of wardrobe, let's uh, re- Fry. I don't think you know this, but the opposite of this movie, just so you know, uh, is uh, the Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants. So I'm going to guess the Traveling Pants matter to that movie some yes. way. Yes, yes, they're, they're magic. <laughs> That's the movie I watched before this, despite yeah. Dustin. So I didn't have a horror movie answer. Uh, change, yeah, that's excellent. Change one thing, <laughs> Fry. I think I would have liked to have seen more sidekick action from the best friend. Mm-hmm. Although I applaud him for not really caring where his friend is and taking the girl he really likes to the dance and then scoring. I would have liked to have seen at least some, you know, adventure concern, like let's go find my boy. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're, we're all going to hit in the same field, but Dustin, what's yours? My change one thing is actually on a smaller scale than that, and, and it is uh, the the sequence where she's going through her scrapbook for the first time, I think just kind of sitting on the floor, not when she's showing it to Brent, but when she's just kind of looking through, the way that the camera is panning over it, that would have been a great opening sequence, mm-hmm. or title sequence, and it should have been. <clears throat> I think I think that would have been, it reminded me of one, and so I, I just thought to myself, this would have been a cool way to open and then immediately go to to the other dark opening, which was the car accident with the with the dude. Like I think I think if you started with that trapper keeper Lisa Frank style, and then like if you keep jerking us around, that would have been that would have been fun. So mine was just minor. In that, I like in that both sense. of those. I, I'm Jamie and Mia's. I just wanted it connected a little more. Like Fry said, even if it's just having Jamie and Mia parking their car outside Lola's house to have sex, like something where they're in closer proximity. So yeah, go look for them. Whatever. Uh, best quote, Ryan. Right. I, I'm gonna I, I'm gonna go with not. <laughs> I'm gonna go with not too deep. I, I think I uh, that that literally has the most memorable part in the movie for me. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm resting. All right, Dustin. Uh, my, mine was close to that. Uh, I think the the one I'll remember is the first time they inflict pain on Brent and they both scream in his face as if this is like a fun thing for them. The, we can't hear you. Oh, gosh. That's oh, mine. Yeah. That's mine. So, right, good. so mine's going to be a little more comedic, but somehow still terrifying, thanks to Robin McLeavy. Is it finger licking good? <laughs> no, that's good, too. I I never thought you could taunt someone and make it menacing with fried chicken, chicken but she did. Ah. So kudos to that. Mm-hmm. All right. It's our time. Sure, it's it's t- our time for the rating and review. Zero to five stars, half star intervals. Brian, what are you giving the loved ones? You know, although I enjoyed it on one watch, I don't think I'll ever watch this again. <laughs> I gave it a I gave it three stars on the fact that I'm I'm happy to say that I've watched it, and then I'm also happy to depart saying I'll never watch it again. <laughs> That's fair. I kind of expected this type of reaction. Dustin? Uh, it's infrequent that I ever uh, am in a situation where I'm like, let's put on a horror flick. But if I am, I will watch this again. I was I was very happy with the recommendation uh, to, to watch it. Uh, and so I'm actually giving this movie... Uh, I, I feel like its ceiling is I, – I don't think its ceiling is capped, but I think it could have reached higher. I'm giving this a four-star movie. Like nice. what the intent was to come out, like did it do exactly what it intended to do? Yes. Did we miss out on some stuff? Yeah, the B story was completely lacking. Mia was uh, – ended up being a like complete like 
like what you said, the biggest loser. Like, and and no, th- the things don't have to work out PG for everyone. But um, I, I think maybe maybe extend this by 10, 12 minutes, and we can expand on some of this other stuff. It's a higher higher rated movie, but yeah. it's still an incredible watch. So four, four stars, and I will watch it again if I'm ever sitting down for a little torture porn. Right. <laughs> I went four stars as well. The movie blew me away the first time I saw it, and I actually catch more and love it more the second go round. So. Put some time and distance, Fry, and maybe revisit later. It's four stars due to the loose connection with Jamie and Mia, but it's got some of the best acting in horror that I can think of. This is not a faint of heart movie, so if you struggle with any any torture esque horror, this does have a better message than most. But yeah, it's it's a rough sit through. So, Brian, do you want to help pick a movie for next time? Absolutely. So we're we're keeping in our spooky month. Option number one, we're going with 1982's Poltergeist. A family's home is haunted by a host of demonic ghosts. Option two, we have 1973's The Exorcist. When a 12-year-old girl is possessed by a mysterious entity, her mother seeks the help of two priests to save her. And option three, all the way back in 1931, we have Dracula. After a naive real estate agent succumbs to the will of Count Dracula, the two head to London where the vampire sleeps in his coffin by day and searches for potential victims by night. Well, that's a really tough choice, Chad, because you have three excellent movies there, and I hope that we actually get around to visiting each of them in the future, but uh, I think we'll have to go with The Exorcist. Okay. All right. We're going to call up the priests. We're going to get an exorcism done. Well, thank you, Dustin. Thank you, Fry, for joining us. Thank you, all the lords, ladies, and knights of the Retro Movie Roundtable. We invite you to reach out to us. We want to hear from you. Comment on our Facebook, anywhere else we will respond. Subscribe, rate, review us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. Give us a like on Facebook. We've got Twitter at movie underscore retro. We've got an email address, retromovieroundtable at yahoo.com. You can even visit our Patreon page at patreon.com slash retro movie roundtable any contribution is much appreciated goes towards making the show better it's fun but it's not free to do as always thank you guys for listening be good to each other and watch more movies brian my mom and dad are gonna be so mad at me